Hey, now everything is compared to that one accomplishment. Now he goes, I can't believe they can land a man on the moon and taste my coffee. <laughs> I think we all would have been a lot happier if we hadn't landed a man on the moon. Then we go, they can't make a prescription bottle top that's easy to open. I'm not surprised they couldn't land a man on the moon. Things make perfect sense to me now. Neil Armstrong should have said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for every whining, complaining SOB on the face of the earth. If you enjoy Astronomy FM radio, please let us know with a small donation. We do rely on your support, and it's true. Every little bit counts. AFM. You are listening to a universe of possibilities. This is Astronomy FM. Coming up next, an Astronomy.FM original program. It's time for York Universe, a co-production of the Observatory of York University, Toronto, and the Voice of Astronomy. AFM Radio. AFM Radio. AFM Radio. AFM Radio. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to York Universe, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and produced by the students, faculty, alumni, and darn good friends of York University. I'll be one of your two hosts for this evening. My name is Paul Delaney, and I'm joined by our good friend, the Doctor. Hi there, everyone. Dr. John's back here tonight again, in the third person, apparently. I can't keep him away. What can I say? We are broadcasting live from the York University Astronomical Observatory located in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And of course, tonight, Monday night, is Astronomy Night in Canada, where the lineup is entirely Canadian, starting with ourselves, York Universe, wandering on into Western worlds, charging across to astronomy cars, quirks and quarks, not to mention science for the people. York Universe broadcasts every Monday night at 9 o'clock local time. Now that, of course, is Eastern Daylight Time here in North America. That is Tuesday morning, 1 a.m. Universal Coordinated Time. The York Universe production works in concert with our online public viewing experience. Hi, Will. Hi, Siren. Uh, they are part of the observatory team. It runs between, at this time of the year, 9 and 10.30 here local time. Please, by all means, find your favorite web browser and point it to astronomy.blog.yorku.ca or, if you like, observatory.info. .yorku.ca. Either of those will get you to the chat room. Have a look at the pods with lots of past images. It's cloudy here in Toronto. Oh, sadly, no rain, but it is very cloudy. So there won't be any live images tonight. But join the chat room, ask questions, and if you stump the team there, we will bail them out. Well, John will bail them out after I read it, of course. Our broadcast is powered by and is in partnership with Astronomy.fm, the voice of astronomy. That's capital V, capital A, by the way. For any questions or comments that you have on our past shows, or if you've got suggestions for future topics, please send us an email, observe at yorku.ca, or follow us on Twitter, which is at York Universe. Okay, right, I think that's all the uh, preliminaries. How's life, John? Oh, life is uh, is good here, and I can I, I I don't know about our audience, but I can hear those capital letters. By the way, ah, well, they they call that emphasis, right? You know, we're just trying to push it along there quite merrily. <laughs> indeed, I, indeed. Yes, there's lots of chat in the chat room, which is very good indeed. Lots of nice images there. I like summer observing, apart from the fact that obviously you don't get so cold. Wonderful images like the Ring Nebula. Ah, yeah, it it's. It's really, really nice to have your eye to the eyepiece at this time of the year. And one of your favorite planets, of course, is up there, John. Oh, no, come on. Your favorite planet. It's got to be Mars, right? Yeah, it would, it would have to be, although these days, I, I must admit, I'm getting a bit more, around a bit more. Uh, well, that's true. You've, you've been there, done that. But I always think of Dr. John and Mars almost in the same sentence. And Mars is remaining in a really nice position for observing at the moment. It's true. It's a, an interesting place to be and lots of great stuff out there. I mean, I had the, the wonderful experience being up in Mount Forest where it's a little bit darker. They have a little more than our classic six stars in the sky that we get here in Toronto. And uh, just a fantastic experience being uh, shown around by the real experts out there. <laughs> yes, you are, of course, referring to Starfest. We had a, uh, a good summation of the exploits of everybody there uh, last Monday night. Um, uh, Richard Block was with us and uh, gave us the rundown on all of the different presentations. You uh, were presenting on what? 
Uh, I was talking a little bit about how we can use our own solar system to be kind of a Rosetta Stone for the galaxy at large and all of the different planets that we see out there. There you go. Well, that sums it up pretty darn well when you think about it. The Rosetta Stone in history here gave light to all sorts of aspects of you know, other languages that we had yet to decipher. And all of a sudden, the Rosetta Stone was wonderful in terms of turning the pages of history. Uh, our solar system is often held up as if we can understand what's happening here, then it becomes the wonderful template for elsewhere. Indeed, indeed. I and mean, one of my, my favorite things about this is that even the images that we have of uh, exoplanets aren't really images, they're artist renderings. And where do the artists get their inspiration? Well, right here at home, looking at our own collection of planets. Quite true. Yeah, that's something which actually a lot of the news media don't always clue into. Uh, the artists' renditions of you know the Tantooine planets and the water worlds and so on and so forth. They're beautiful images, and you know from the point of view of science fiction, I love them. I know that it's science fiction, not science fact. But the media grabs a hold of them, unfortunately, uh, and often thinks that that's what you know the Hubble telescope or pick your favorite telescope has actually imaged and that is not the case they get always a little bit sorrowful when I have to point that out to them it, it is a little unfortunate and, and one of the the fun things I mean often and you've seen some of the talks I've given I, I talk about the era before we sent out spacecraft and the views we have from telescopes well for exoplanets it's not even that good it's more like the view that uh, Tycho Brahe had that naked eye observing Points of light, yeah. And That's right. More. Yeah, it's, it's, it sums it up very well. That will change. It's not going to change in a hurry, but it will change uh, in, in the hopefully not too many distant decades. I'd like to be able to see some of these exoplanets up close and personal <laughs> before I pass on. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Indeed, uh, indeed. All right, we should move along here. This week in space and astronomy history, and I'll start off the uh, charge here, and I'm going to start talking about one of your favorite planets. So, Viking 1, both the orbiter and lander combination, was launched on August 20th, 1975. Hard to believe we're talking 41 years ago. Arriving at Mars orbit in June, uh, June 19th to be specific, 1976. Now, the lander portion of this was a 572-kilogram vehicle, which is you know, not a bad size, uh, arrived at the surface July 20th, and it continued to operate until November 13th, 1982. So that's over four years of continuous operation. And unfortunately, we will uh, have to admit that it would have have continued longer if not for the fact that we actually <clears throat> overwrote where Earth was. One of the software updates overwrote the memory portion that said where the antenna needed to point and we lost communication with it in November of 1982. So uh, unfortunately that was a little bit of operator error. Uh, but that In fact, it might be the operator. <laughs> it does have a nuclear uh, power generator. That's right. That's right. But if you don't know where to point your antenna, yeah bit of a problem. Anyway, that was a, a six year, or the, close enough to, to six years of continuous operation, and that was a record that uh, was only eclipsed by the rover Opportunity. Uh, of course, Opportunity has been on the surface now for oh, 12 years and counting, uh, so you know, it is well and truly the eclipse to the Viking Lander 1. But up until Opportunity, Viking Lander 1 held the record for the longest continuous operation uh, of a vehicle on the surface of Mars. Apart from the first images that uh, were transmitted back from the surface and the continuous transmission of that data for, as we've just said, six years, uh, it conducted the first set of biology experiments that remain somewhat controversial to this day. Uh, there is still, in general terms, the expectation that what they detected was chemistry rather than biology. But every now and again, you see an article, John, that suggests that maybe, just maybe, there was a little more biology mixed in there than uh, people were prepared to believe in the 1970s and 80s. Well, even on the team itself, it's still a little bit controversial. Not everyone's convinced that it's just purely chemistry. That's right. Not bad for a 40-year-old vehicle, a data set from a vehicle in the 1970s. 
Indeed, and we're still learning new things about it. And I still see papers published every so often. And uh, you know, as we learn more and more about the red planet, we go back and look at this past data in a new light, and we learn more even from you know these older records. Which which just goes to show you that the data that we accumulate really continues to tell stories long after it's been collected. Uh, we're talking here specifically about Viking 1 and the data from the surface of Mars, but you know, moon rocks continue to be analyzed long after the 1969 to 1972 pickup, and you know, we're finding you know, it, it continues to tell us stuff about the lunar surface, including the moisture content. I think of, and we'll be talking about this a little bit later on, all of the uh, stellar images that have been picked up by observatories over the last 150 years, the glass plates, how they represent pieces of history that help understand the data that we collect today. So lots to be said for maintaining those data sets, keeping them safe, keeping them pristine, not just the, um, uh, shall we say, the data reduced versions, but the original raw data. So you can always go back to that first principle and check things out. Well, it's interesting in particular that you mentioned the lunar samples, of course, one of the national treasures of the United States. And uh, we get more and more samples, and we're hopeful to get a few more samples from celestial bodies in a couple years' time. And, and when you collect these samples, you always set aside a certain amount for later because you know that the technology is going to get better, you're going to get new analysis techniques, and so you want to have something still left over so you can continue to, to learn from that. Now, that's actually a very good point. Um, does that tell me, and I, I don't know the answer to this, but does that tell me that some of the moon rocks were deliberately set aside from the 1969-1972 for exactly that type of analysis that you're suggesting? That's exactly right. The, uh, the whole point here is that you don't want to use up all the sample that you bring back. You have so much that you set aside for immediate analysis and sometimes you can distribute a little bit to partner labs if there's enough material. And then there's some that you safeguard for later use once the uh, technology improves. Now, of course, uh, you know, going out to a, a, a body like the moon or an asteroid to collect sample isn't the only way that we get samples of these particular uh, rocks. We can actually get samples delivered for free through meteorites. And uh, yeah. this is an excellent segue, I think, into our, our next day in history here. <laughs> well, it, it certainly is, although not quite our next one, but getting there, because let me just talk about Voyager 2 for a sec. So hold that thought, okay? And for then sure. We'll, and then, no, then we'll move on to yours. <laughs> well, no, no need to give you a break if you don't want one, Paul. Ah, oh, well, what a guy. All right, go for it. Tell us about that rock that we found in Antarctica. All right. Well, it's uh, definitely one of the most uh, well-known you know, superstar of meteorites out there. You've got uh, this rock, and it's got the, you know, not the greatest name, kind of dry, ALH84001. What that tells you is that it was the first rock that was found by the uh, Antarctic Search for Meteorites in 1984 around uh, the Allen Hills area of Antarctica. So that's, you know, it's more of a descriptive title. But it really made a splash quite a bit later, 12 years later, on August 7th of 1996. That's when we had the announcement that rocked the planetary science world. Looking into this particular rock, there was the idea that maybe you had something that was like biology in there. Allen Hills 84001 is a very unique rock. It's from Mars. We know it's from Mars based on the composition of the gas that's trapped in it. It looks just like the atmosphere but it's also the oldest rock that we have from Mars. So it comes from that early period when we think ours, Mars might have been nice and warm and wet. And inside a special mineral called carbonates, which has an association with life on the Earth, we find these really strange little uh, shapes that kind of look like bacteria or other biological uh, uh, filigree type of things. And uh, you know, it's something that uh, is still a little controversial as to whether that's what they are. They're definitely very, very small features, smaller than any biology that we have here on the Earth. At the same time, there is the question of, you know, whether this is a precursor, what's going on here. So by and large, most scientists today think that this particular rock is not an example of an early Martian biology, 
But my oh my, back in 96, it was a huge story. And uh, the whole renaissance of planetary science in the 1990s was really kick-started by uh, this, along with, of course, the Pathfinder mission, back when science broke the Internet. <laughs> Sums it up very well. I, I do remember the, the August of 1996 because not only was it a really important press conference that NASA, of course, was announcing, uh, there was actually a contribution from um, the President of the United States. Um, Bill Clinton made an announcement, uh, if you will, uh, you know, heralding the actual press conference. Uh, because let's face it, if this had come to be, that is to say, this was the press conference that announced the possibility of life in this meteorite and further verification had yielded a positive confirmation, then you know everybody wanted to be in on the act. And so the President of the United States wanted to be able to say, yeah, I was there, I, I led the charge, I made the announcement, etc., etc., etc. It has probably not come to pass in that regard, as you said, John, uh, that most of the uh, follow-up observations have more or less concluded that it was geology and chemistry, not biology. But that poor little meteorite, it started out about 1.93 kilograms. I think it's probably down to a few hundred grams. It, no, not, not quite. But it's, it certainly has been analyzed to death and, as you say, really has kick-started a renaissance as far as planetary observations and astrobiology in general. You can date it all the way back to 1996. Indeed, it's one of this sort of rare class of meteorites called the SNCs from Mars. And so, you know, we have that nice little fingerprint within them that identifies them. The great thing about going to a place like Antarctica is that you can have all of these rocks sort of captured and they're on that nice white background so you can identify them reasonably easily. And they're eroding their way out. I mean, with Allen Hills, it probably fell something like 13,000 years ago. And uh, you can go down there and uh, get samples of it, or at least the Antarctic Search for Meteorites does this on a regular basis, which is really nice because I can tell you that buying these on the open market is not cheap. <laughs> it is not, but you're absolutely right. Um, you know, science expeditions go down there every year into the southern hemisphere summer, so December, January, February, uh, and they literally are picking up hundreds per year. Uh, the expeditions are very, very fruitful in terms of the number of meteorites they're picking up. Not all Martian meteorites, obviously, uh, but meteorites in general. I, I think last I read there's something like 30 or 40 confirmed Martian meteorites that have been found to date on Earth. Do you remember the uh, number, John? I don't remember the specific number, but that sounds like it's in the, uh, in the, the right area. Yeah, it's, it's not a huge number. As I said, we find hundreds per year. Uh, we're only able to absolutely, with, with great certainty, uh, determine the locations for a very small fraction of them. We can date the, uh, sorry, we can uh, confirm the Martian origins. We can confirm the lunar origins. After that, it becomes a little bit more speculative. Uh, there are various families of uh, main belt asteroids that we suspect have got meteorites here on Earth, but the vast majority of the meteorites we find, we really do not know their origin. But they do give us pieces of the puzzle uh, of our early solar system and the uh, origins, development of the solar system. The ALH84001 is particularly helpful because it's about 4 billion years old, I think, is the current dating on it, which makes it you know, very, very old. That's right. It's unique among the SNCs. In fact, it's by far and away uh, the oldest of that. And that's sort of the crystallization age. That's when the rock formed. It's not when it was blasted off of Mars, which was something like 17 million years ago. Indeed. Yeah, the, the, the history of, of these sorts of rocks is, is quite fascinating. My class always marvels at the fact that we can say, yes, it's, it's been on Earth give or take 13,000 years that it left Mars for Earth about 17 million years ago, yet the rock is 4 billion. I mean, it's, you know, when you piece together the information, the radioactive dating for the age, the cosmic, uh, bomb cosmic ray bombardment uh, for its travel in interstellar space and so on, oh, sorry, interplanetary space, it all is a wonderful, wonderful story. It's amazing what you can tell from 1.93 kilograms of rock. <laughs> Absolutely.
All right, our third and final this uh, this week in space and astronomy history is from a similar era. Voyager 2, the 825-kilogram spacecraft, was launched on August 20th, 1977, uh, on its journey to the outer solar system, legendary journey to the outer solar system. It became the first, and at the moment to date, the only spacecraft to fly by Uranus. That was January of 86. I should actually throw this to the chat room, but somebody would Google it too darn quickly. Uh, it flew by Neptune in August of 1989, uh, and this is all after its uh, initial encounters with Jupiter, July of 79, and Saturn in 1981. Interestingly enough, the spacecraft continues to transmit data. And in fact, if you look on the web, you'll find that uh, you know, it, the Voyager mission is really divided up into its time hanging out in the planetary domain, that is to say Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And that time frame is, give or take a bit, 12, 13 years. And then the interstellar mission, which is the rest of its life, and that's like about 26 years at this point in time, when the mission planners were uh, putting this uh, whole mission together back in the early 70s, I dare say very few of them expected the spacecraft to continue to be operating successfully uh, at 2016. But that's exactly what it is doing. The spacecraft continues to transmit data from a distance of about 112 astronomical units. That's 15.5 light hours from Earth or the Sun, close enough to being the same thing at this point. Uh, and of course, it's approaching interplanetary space. It's about to cross the uh, heliopause. Uh, it's moving through the heliosheath as defined by its predecessor, Voyager 1, which skipped through that region about three or four years ago. So Voyager 2 is, is trailing behind Voyager 1 because it had a few other things to do on its way out. Uh, but nonetheless, 112 astronomical units. That's a stunning distance. That's 112 times the distance the Earth is from the Sun. And as I said, this vehicle was launched August 20th, 1977, so 39 years ago. Pretty darn good uh, for, for a spacecraft, John. It's definitely managing. I mean, that's your, your good design. You think of, you know, opportunity as well, also vastly exceeding its uh, design lifetime. And one thing that I always enjoy with these missions where you have more than one spacecraft is the, the way that you name them, the way that you number them. So I don't know if many people appreciate this, but Voyager 2 was the first launch of the Voyager spacecraft program. Yes. Voyager 1 came later. So maybe I shouldn't spoil it for those people tuning in in the first week of September, but <laughs> Voyager 1 was actually the second one launched. And the reason for that is that the uh, celestial mechanics made it so that the launch in early September would get the spacecraft there to Jupiter faster. And so to avoid any confusion upon the arrival of Jupiter, it was designated that Voyager 1 would get there first, and so it had to launch second. Celestial mechanics, ain't it grand? <laughs> and eventually Voyager 2 will pass Voyager 1 again as it got more of those gravitational assists on its way out of the solar system. So even though Voyager 1 was the first to, uh, to leave the solar system, uh, Voyager 2 will go and overtake it once more eventually. Again, it you know, was was really exciting times watching Voyager. You know, looking up the dates. You know, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more next week because that's closer to the anniversary of the flyby of Neptune. But uh, you know, being able to arrange for the data to actually make it back to the Earth for the flyby of Uranus and then Neptune. Those distances for the Voyager spacecraft when the Voyagers were launched were actually beyond the capability of the deep space network. So you know, the spacecraft, once it's launched, has got you know, its power already defined, so the transmitter has only a certain amount of capability. What we had to do, of course, was proceed ahead and upgrade the deep space network here so we could actually listen to all that wonderful data that was being picked up by the spacecraft. It was a really exciting time in that sense. It's always a good argument for your funding agency. I have a spacecraft on the way to Uranus and no way to listen to it. Please help. <laughs> oh, you're a cynic. Dr. John, you're a cynic. <laughs> and something that I, I well, on, on the positive side, if I if I can, you know, go and, uh, and 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 talk about something that that is really fantastic. I mean, the opportunity 
to do the grand tour, to visit each one of the outer planets in order, only comes around about once every 176 odd years or so, you know, give or take 10 or 20 years. And the fact of the matter is that the 1970s was probably the first time the human race was actually capable of launching this kind of spacecraft. So if that opportunity had come around even 10, 15 years earlier, we would have missed it. And uh, neither of us and none of our listeners out there would have the wonderful images that we have of Uranus and Neptune, places like Miranda, places like, like Triton. We would not have seen them yet. Absolutely true, yeah. We were in the right place at the right time with just enough of the right technology to go ahead and do it. And even then, the mission nearly got scrubbed. I mean, you know, fighting for the funding for the Voyager probes, the two pioneer predecessors, that was all a little bit touch and go there for the Grand Tour. It's amazing the lead time on spacecraft. Uh, what eventually became Cassini started out as a mission called SOP-2, which was kicked off in 1972. So with the end of Cassini coming up in a few years' time, we're seeing this, this vast amount of time in which that mission was discussed in one form or another, where approvals were sought, where equipment was built, where data was taken and analyzed. It's amazing the, uh, the legacy of some of these uh, spacecraft. 1972. Even I didn't realize that. I had thought it was in the 80s when you know the the concept of Cassini was being tossed around because it didn't launch, if memory serves, until 97. That's right, 97, and the instruments were selected, and if memory serves, 89. Uh, but the idea of sending a probe out to Saturn to send something into the Saturnian atmosphere and into uh, and, and into the atmosphere of Titan, hence uh, Saturn orbiter with two probes, I said, uh, P2 or 2P. Uh, that concept was born way back in the early 70s, in, and, at the very end of the Apollo era. And obviously somewhere along the line they decided to jettison, pardon the pun, uh, the idea of that second probe into the Saturnian atmosphere. Well, you know, things change, you get uh, different constraints. Cassini has managed quite well without a, uh, a movable scan platform like the Voyagers had. That's right. That's exactly right. Voyagers 1 and 2 both have movable scan platforms. As I recall, Voyager 2 scan platform had its issues as well. Yeah, that got stuck quite early on in the mission. Just Not shows you... Shirts. It just goes to show that there's a lot of resilience, there's a lot of give and take, there is a lot of ingenuity, uh, both before as well as during a mission. Indeed. Sometimes we, we repurpose these spacecraft to do things that we, uh, we never thought they would do them. And that, that, that goes for spacecraft like the, uh, the Kepler spacecraft that had some trouble with its reaction wheels and you had to come up with what to do with it. The invention of the, the JPEG protocol for dealing with Galileo after the uh, high gain antenna failed to open, and using assets that are out there that are just that just keep on performing, like the Voyagers, to look at interstellar space, places where they were never intended to go, or at least not intended to still be able to communicate with us when they got there. Not half bad. Well, hats off to Viking One to Voyager 2, and as we've just finished up with this week in space and astronomy history, ALH 84001. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Dr. John and myself, Paul, chat somewhat eloquently about life, the universe, and everything in the past. Uh, by all means, please point your favorite web browser to observatory.info.yorku.ca or astronomy blog.yorku.ca. Head on over to the chat room. There's a vigorous conversation going there. Uh, the usual uh, collection of suspects is there. Good evening, Black Projects. And the observatory team happily showing you some past images because it is cloudy here in southern Ontario. So, John, just a couple of things in passing before we get to the main news items. Uh, we probably could have thrown this into the space and astronomy history, but we found it out a little bit late. But August 17th represents the uh, anniversary of the discovery of Phobos and Deimos, the two satellites of Mars discovered by Asaph Hall. 
Yes, indeed. That happened uh, quite a while ago. Do you have the year on the tip of your tongue? Yeah, you know what? For whatever reason, I didn't put it here, but I'm going to go that it was somewhere in the 1870s. That would be my bet, and I'm sure Black Projects or somebody will tell me soon enough what the answer is. I see 1877, so I'll I'll claim the fastest finger on that. There you go. Well, I said the 1870s, so that's not bad. I was within a few. (laughs) But hard to believe that uh, it took to that point in time to actually find those two guys. But, you know, they were tiny. I mean, uh, Phobos is, what, about 25 kilometers along its longest axis? Ah, that's one I need to go and double-check as well. It's not a big guy, whichever way you want to well, cut neither it. Neither one of them are large. I mean, they're not big enough so that they uh, are able to circularize themselves, not like that, our own. That's quite correct. And, of course, both of them are moving in relatively tight orbits. Again, I think Phobos has got like a seven- or eight-hour orbital period around Mars, so they're really, really close in, close and therefore uh, hard to distinguish against the bright point of light that we call Mars. Indeed, and they're, they're a really active area. I mean, these are bodies that I think we'll want to visit in the near future. They look, in many ways, a lot like asteroids, but they may not be. There are a couple of different uh, theories out there for their formation, and we don't really know which one's right. Quite true. Quite true. Uh, one of the other items for uh, this, uh, for for a quick little uh, summary update. Last week was, of course, the Perseid meteor shower, peaking in the early morning hours of uh, August 12th. That was Friday morning. And as predicted, the... um, the the um, uh, the rate at which the meteors were pounding our atmosphere was between two and three times what is normal. Normally, we pick up anywhere from sixty to a hundred meteors per hour if you're in a nice dark sky. That's the uh, zenith rate. Uh, and by all accounts that I've been reading, uh, the rate was closer to two hundred last week. So uh, the, that factor of two or three, uh, a slight increase in the density of the stream of material that we were passing through. Uh, Um, uh, There was a lot of good dark skies early in the week last week, but at least here in southern Ontario, yeah, from Thursday onwards, it's not been all that swift. So we did not see too many meteors uh, in the sky from uh, Toronto area on Friday, Friday morning. But uh, I have seen reports all the way over to Saskatchewan that uh, reported some pretty good skies. At the same time, meteors are one of the few things that you can see, you know, nice and consistently here in a place like Toronto. I mean, we've got our, our usual six stars, the ever take. But if you just go outside and uh, lie back, relax, look up at the sky for uh, a few tens of minutes, it's likely you'll see one or two. Well, that's exactly right. Meteors, if you're well dark adapted in a nice dark sky with the absence of a moon, you know, the chances are pretty darn good that you will be able to see a few of them streak across the sky. And while you're waiting to see the meteor, you could always catch a um, satellite wandering by the International Space Station and an Iridium flare. There's all sorts of good stuff so above. Mm-hmm. Uh, Speaking of good stuff that's above, if you are indeed outside under clearer skies, which we don't have at the moment, uh, you're running out of time to go and catch Jupiter. It's beginning to get perilously low in the western sky. It's it's glimmering above my neighbor's rooftop uh, as uh, twilight ends. So so the amount of uh, observable days left for Jupiter, (laughs) definitely getting fewer and fewer in number. But fear not, Mars and Saturn remain pretty good sights there in the southwest sky. They are a little low, unfortunately, for us mid-northern hemisphere uh, latitudes, but nonetheless, Saturn is always an excellent sight. Mars, uh, we're well past opposition for both the planets these days, but, um, you know, if you've got a small telescope, Mars and Saturn are well worth seeing. And if you hang out till midnight or thereabouts, you can swing your scope across. You will now need star charts or setting circles, but uh, Neptune and then Uranus are both rising. So uh, it, it's not too bad a time to catch all of the planets. Venus is sneaking into our evening sky. It's still very low at the moment in the west. Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and then if you're just a little patient, waiting for the latter part of the evening, Uranus and Neptune. So it's it's a good planetary time of the year, John. Well, for me, all times of the year are good planetary times. Ah, uh, yes. What can I say? <laughs> 
if you were up late on uh, Sunday, no, Saturday night, it was Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, everybody will know that SpaceX has done it again. They launched a Japanese communications satellite into orbit and then promptly brought their uh, first stage of their Falcon 9 back to the floating platform in the Atlantic. Um, what, what's the name of that floating platform? Uh, of course, I still love you. <laughs> I love the name. Uh, at any rate, this is the sixth successful landing, the fourth at sea uh, for the SpaceX company. They've nailed both of their uh, landings, their, uh, their land landings back at Cape Canaveral. They've uh, now put four successfully down on the uh, barge at sea. So six all together. And one one of those uh, has been brought back and has now been test fired, I believe, about four times for two and a half minutes each. So they're beginning to really gather some serious data with respect to the performance of these vehicles uh, after return. I have not heard of a date yet for when they are planning to try and redeploy a uh, well to deploy a satellite with a redeployed first stage, but it is coming, uh, and obviously SpaceX is very very happy with their uh, ability to bring their assets back to uh, to ground safely. Well, certainly it's something that uh, you know it, it's nice to be able to reuse as it brings down the cost of access to space. But I can understand the trepidation of those people putting payload on the top of the rocket. You know, who wants to go first with the reused ones? <laughs> I, I dare say there will be a significant discount, shall we say, for that first customer. Or maybe they've got another wheel of cheese to send to orbit. <laughs> True enough. It's very impressive, however, to see SpaceX operating so successfully at this point in time. Okay, enough of these little tidbits in passing. Time for a little bit of news. We've got a few articles here. For those of you who were with us last week, you will recall that our last full article that we were chatting about was Dark Matter, uh, how a lot of the current searches are oh, coming up empty. Uh, we were talking about the Lux uh, observations. That's the, um, uh, the, is the underground xenon detector that uh, was trying to find evidence for a dark matter particle, uh, and it was unsuccessful over the last couple of years' worth of data collection now. Uh, but we finished that article, and I was about to plow onto another uh, dark energy search, which is underway, and of course we ran out of time. So dark energy is up, and this is part two of the conversation that we were having last week. Dark energy, of course, is the name that we give to the unknown cause of observations uh, that suggest that the universe is the universe's expansion is accelerating. I mean, we know we live in an expanding universe, but back now, nearly 20 years ago, we suddenly realized that that expansion rate was accelerating, not deaccelerating as we were sort of expecting, courtesy of matter and gravity. Uh, but what's causing that uh, rate of acceleration? And of course, we don't know the answer to that. There are some theories as to what may be the cause, but none have given scientists any great confidence that the mystery is on its way Way to being solved. However, progress is underway in trying to figure out what is dark energy. And the latest uh, tool, if you will, uh, has been delivered by hundreds of astronomers from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, that's the SDSS, the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics over there in Germany. They have put together a map of 1.2 2 million galaxies. I'm going to say that again. They've put together a map of 1.2 million galaxies spanning a volume in space of 650 cubic billion light years. That's a lot of space. The largest map of galaxies ever compiled, or at least yet compiled. Okay, so why are they putting together so many galaxies? Well, over a decade, and it took them that long to put all of the measurements in place, uh, and that's what's embedded in this map, it is allowing scientists to probe the nature of the expansion of the universe over not just a very large region in space, but also over a very long time scale. 
okay because remember we are looking deeper into space it's not just the volume but it's also the time that is associated with the uh, the volume this is because the baryonic oscillations uh, sorry it's called the baryon I'll try that again it is called the baryon oscillation spectroscopic survey BOSS for short, okay, and it's part of, as I said, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, they are generating really precise measurements by studying the tug between dark energy and dark matter. So dark matter and uh, regular matter that we see, baryonic matter, that represents the gravitational signature associated with galaxies. And so that signature is embodied by the galaxies but by measuring how the galaxies are moving with respect to each other they can actually measure how much is um, the dark matter tug the gravitational tug is being overcome by the expansion rate the scientists were able to determine thus the baryonic acoustic oscillation so this is the measure that they use to try and determine how much the expansion of the universe is overcoming the gravitational tug that brings material back together so the map of the 1.2 million galaxies allows them to measure this baryonic acoustic oscillation and therefore they can actually measure the expansion rate of the universe over and above what we're seeing with respect to the gravitational tug that's keeping the galaxies galaxy groups together using only the observational data and imposing no theoretical assumptions the result the results so far have shown that there is in fact this unaccounted for effect driving the expansion of the universe that is to say dark energy does exist and that the numerical values found so far are really very very accurate so the measurements are really accurate sort of within plus or minus five percent saying that in short using the BAO the baryonic oscillate baryonic acoustic oscillations across some seven billion years of time that's in this 650 cubic billion light year <laughs> volume in space that the time that we're seeing that the expansion of the universe is being driven by something and that's something of course we have dubbed dark energy so bottom line to all this we really do see an acceleration in the expansion rate that it is driving the galaxies further and further apart in a way that is accounted for by the notion of dark energy. So unlike dark matter where we haven't yet found that darn elusive particle, we are seeing evidence from the galaxy distributions for dark energy. Very, very interesting times that we live in, John. Well and truly beyond the solar system. <laughs> Indeed, going off to the, uh, the furthest stretches, the furthest reaches of, of space and time, as it were. Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is just continuing to expand its map. So we've got 1.2 million now. They are going to continue this process uh, looking for ever greater detail for the, um, you know, the BAO uh, over a longer time scale. And hopefully, they'll be able to further quantify the notion of dark energy. And, of course, there's lots of people out there who are building the theories into you know, how it came into existence at the Big Bang. But that's all well and truly above my <laughs> pay scale. I do not understand some of those theories. I, it's as simple as that. Well, this is definitely one of those uh, these interesting projects you know, that are going out there and gathering a lot of data to be sifted through and cut in various different ways by scientists and really anybody who's interested in uh, what's going on and you know what's coming out of it, it reminds me of you know our own spacecraft missions that we send out into the solar system that you collect that bunch of data and maybe years later that you look at it in a new light and you find something you never thought you would absolutely it's it's really really interesting stuff even if I, it is drenched in mathematics but it does talk to us about the way our universe is expanding Indeed. 
Well, if if I can, I bring the uh, the discussion back to our, our backyard. You know, practically, you know, inside our own celestial house. Sounds fine. Talk about my, uh, as you mentioned earlier, my favorite planet. If I'm to play favorites, and that would be Mars. And of course, when you're talking about Mars, you just can't avoid water. It seems like every year there's a new story about water on Mars, despite the original discovery in the polar caps back in the 1960s. But that's just because water is, is such an interesting thing. Often when we go to Mars, we're following the water. Water has this, this lovely association with habitability, with life. And one of the most exciting water discoveries that we've seen in the last decade came about six years ago uh, with a team at the University of Arizona uh, led by Alfred McEwen using the high rise camera, which is run out of the U of A. And they happen to note that on different slopes, what you would get is this seasonal recurrence of dark streaks, these recurring slope linea, they called it. In some ways, the blandest possible name, but they, they really hinted at something else. So the recurring slope linea, the RSLs, we always suspected that it was water that was going on, that was driving these features. And in fact, last year, you know, we put the final nail in the coffin there. And what do we see? Lots of salts. This is something that was really exciting. A big uh, announcement by NASA last September, actually, that we saw that, that salt, that uh, briny water flowing out onto the surface. Now, as I mentioned, this debate about the possibility of water on Mars, it's almost as old as our exploration of uh, Mars itself. It goes all the way back to our earliest spacecraft. And really, apart from the obvious shaping of the planetary surface, uh, the existence of water within easy reach of any future human explorers or settlers is indeed very promising news for those people who are thinking along those lines eventually. There is an additional little wrinkle, though, that sort of come into this lovely story about having these, uh, these little lineae, having these little um, dark streaks caused by water gushing out of the inside of the planet, out of aquifers. And that comes from some research led by Matthew Chudnacki, also from the University of Arizona, my alma mater. And what they're suggesting is we may need to rethink exactly what the origin of this briny water is. They don't contest that uh, briny water is what creates these RSLs. What they suggest is that it might not be coming from aquifers on the inside. What gives them that, uh, that, that sort of hint that it might not be from aquifers themselves is the fact that when they look for these RSLs, they find them all over the place. They find them in places where aquifers cannot possibly be, like mountaintops, for instance. And the area that they looked at all throughout Valles Marineris, they found things pretty much wherever they looked. So now the question is, where does that water come from? And there is a process that'll do it. It's something that we call deliquescence. So anybody who has you know, tried to clear a snowy driveway in the wintertime will recognize the power of salt even just regular sodium chloride salt, it changes that freezing point of water and moves it from zero degrees Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit, for those of you in the United States, all the way down to minus 22 Celsius. That is the lowest temperature at which your lovely salt mixture can stay nice and, and briny. And in fact, with a really, really strong salt, like the perchlorate salts that we saw at the Phoenix landing site, you can get water all the way down to something like minus 68 for very specialized salts in the, to the minus 70s. These salts love water so much that they can pull it directly from the atmosphere until they create a brine for themselves. And maybe that's what's going on here, is that the water in the atmosphere is getting caught up in these salty brines. And so wherever there's enough water in the atmosphere, wherever there is enough of this salt, you get this liquid, and then it just proceeds downhill. Now, we had thought there wasn't quite enough water vapor in the Martian atmosphere to really drive this process. So if this is indeed what's happening, it suggests that there might be more than we uh, had anticipated. However, I will point out that Valles Marineris is one of these places on equatorial Mars where we see a lot of early morning fog. 
and we see that in a number of the craters and topographic lows as well. So it could be a case where the water vapor is just recycling because Valles Marineris is quite a deep feature on Mars. It uh, has its own circulations. So really, uh, this one is not yet uh, decided. The debate here, clearly not yet over, but uh, either way, it's uh, just getting more interesting. I would never have thought that there was enough water vapor in the Martian atmosphere. All, all of my readings had suggested that uh, there just wasn't very much there at all. But with this uh, research, the suggestion, as you say, is that there may well be enough to generate that absorption process, that deliquescence, and you know, instead of the hoped-for aquifer is full of water that, you know, are just waiting for us to tap into. We may have to uh, sort of try and distill some of that water from the atmosphere. That's not nearly as uh, helpful a process for, uh, you know, the, the Martian colonists, shall we say. Well, we are spoiled here on Earth. We, uh, we definitely have very good proven water reserves as compared to many other planets, at least in the inner solar system. Yeah, quite true. We've got more water than we can shake a stick at in most places. Although, I, as I said to you at the beginning of the show, uh, off air, I really would like a little more water for my garden here. But <laughs> that's that's just a local affair. So these RSLs, the story, is, the, the the jury is still out whether or not it is water from beneath the ground, water from the atmosphere, or perhaps indeed a combination of both. Um, do we know, John, whether or not there is any uh, additional insights that, for example, Curiosity is going to be able to uh, provide for this, this process to solve this dilemma? It's possible, although the interesting thing with Curiosity is that we are in an abnormal place. Just about every deep crater in equatorial Mars shows fogs in the early morning. This is something that uh, has been seen by the ExoMars orbiter. It's on that uh, very long, loopy orbit, and so it, it gets to see things on Mars at unusual times of the day, uh, different from a mapping orbiter. The one place where they've never seen any of these fogs, any of these clouds, is Gale. And with our own instrumentation, it seems like Gale is a pretty darn dry place. If uh, you think of the Atacama as the driest place on the Earth, well, Gale Crater, where Curiosity is, is the Atacama of Mars. Yet we went there because of its past history of water, as I recall. That's right. Going from lakes to now, this Atacama of Mars, quite the uh, turn of events. <laughs> but it's definitely a place that tells us stories. And that's what we're reading in the rocks. Well, that, that's exactly right, and this is why you, you can't just go to one place on a given object, in this case Mars, and expect to be able to tell the whole story from that one particular landing site. It's like trying to understand the entire Earth history by only, say, visiting the Great Canadian Shield. If you did that, you would certainly uh, not be able to piece together the entire history of our planet. So, yeah, you've got to be in a number of different places at a number of different times throughout the years uh, to be able to put together the complete story. Without a doubt, and I think of all the spacecraft that have visited planets, the one that has visited the most atypical place would be the Galileo Entry Probe, going into a place on Jupiter where there is no cloud at all. It's like landing in the Sahara and then thereby determining that the Earth has no life and no water. <laughs> and of course, well, we're smarter than that, so... Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. yeah we'll, we'll talk more about the Galileo probe at another point in time. Okay, let's head out of the solar system briefly back to one of the Kepler satellites finds. And uh, I dare say you will not remember what uh, K1C 8462 2 was, but it is more commonly referred to as Tabby Star. It's an F-type star found by the Kepler data, and it exhibits significant and non-periodic brightness fluctuations. Ring a bell, anybody yet? Affectionately called Tabby Star, after the then postdoctoral researcher Tabitha 
uh, I'm never able to pronounce her surname. So with apologies, Boyajan from Yale University, this star has perplexed, even defied astronomers to account for these brightness fluctuations. So this is about a year or so ago. Recall that the usual patterns of variation of a transiting exoplanet, that's what the Kepler satellite is looking for, is one that causes periodic, and I underscore the word periodic here, dimming of the planet's uh, sorry, dim, dimming of the parent star uh, on time scales that's measured in hours. So you know, it passes the the planet passes in front of the parent star from our point of view, dims the light for maybe a few hours, maybe as short as a couple of hours, but generally speaking, a few hours. And the depth of that eclipse, in other words, how much light is blocked, is typically a few percent at best, often considerably less than that. But it's regular as clockwork if it's a planet that's orbiting that star. Tabby's star, however, yields brightness variations that exceeded over 20% of the dimming of the starlight. And it did that over time scales irregularly measured in days, not hours, in days. This, needless to say, really did perplex everybody, scratching of the head and so on. Having exhausted all all of the usual explanations the best astronomers could come up with is that we were looking at a swarm, I'm not sure if that's the right term, but a swarm of comets disintegrating a la Schumacher-Levy 9. Remember that comet that sort of flew in a little bit too close to Jupiter back in 1992 and then came back and socked Jupiter in 1994? So comet Schumacher-Levy 9, now multiply that up by you know a hundredfold or thereabouts. Maybe that's what we were observing. Wasn't a particularly satisfying explanation, but it was the best one that we came up with. So we uh, went ahead and uh, sort of looked at it and looked at it and looked at it. And we concluded that, well, we really didn't believe it. So what do we do when we don't understand those sorts of things? Ah, oh, well, we revert to alien megastructures. Well, that wasn't a very satisfying explanation, although it was very exciting, but it really wasn't very satisfying. Call went out for more data, and so astronomers started digging into uh, the archives, into the history of the of any observations of Tabby Star to see what trends may have existed. Uh, so basically supplementing Kepler's data. And then we actually went back into the Kepler data set itself because Kepler's data was being used primarily to look for transiting exoplanets. We'd never really looked hard at the long-term trends. If there was a variable star in the Kepler data set, that's fine varying on timescales of hours or days, but we weren't really looking at things that had timescales of months to years. So they started doing that. Okay, well, it's a longer story, but let's just cut to the chase here. It appears that Tabby's star is indeed fading. Brad Schaefer from Louisiana University sifted through the history plates at the Harvard College Observatory, basically a hundred years of glass plates, and concluded that the star was fading by as much as 0.16 magnitudes per century. Uh, putting that out there in the public domain, there was a little bit of yelling and screaming, astronomically speaking, in the literature. Uh, but you know, the conclusion was that the star did seem to be fading. Well, Two other guys, uh, Manette and Simon, suggested from the Kepler data set itself that the rate of fading of Tabby Star was in fact twice that rate in the first three years of the Kepler data set and then increased dramatically, like several fold, in the last year of the data set. So, Unfortunately, of course, you know, we're no longer looking at Tabby Star, so we can't interpret any more data from the Kepler data set. But over the four years that we were able to observe Tabby Star, there certainly did appear to be a significant dimming in support of Schaefer's historical analysis. What does that mean? Well, that's a darn good question. We're really not sure what it means, but it certainly does say to us that Tabby Star has got a really rich history and that it deserves a lot more analysis. And so the word is out there. People are observing this star now. Uh, of course, we've had the SETI people listening in on Tabby Star. Nothing to report as far as ET is concerned, but the mystery surrounding both Tabby Star as well as the light variations that we've been detecting with Kepler remains. 
Stay tuned for further information. Definitely a little bit of um, mystery here, John. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, 20%, we could see that easily with the, the 40 centimeter. Heck, we could probably see that with the, uh, the 4 centimeter I just have. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. I, I, I am really quite surprised that um, of all of the stars uh, that Kepler was observing, 150,000 of them, roughly speaking, if memory serves, uh, that we only found really one bizarre one one really bizarre star, and that's Tabby Star. Well, you know, a good question. You know, what is the fraction of bizarre stars in the uh, in the galaxy? <laughs> well, that, therein lies a good point. Don't know is the answer to that. <laughs> but uh, you know, obviously, the more we dive into this data set uh, uh, from Kepler, the more interesting things we are going to find. Indeed. Okay, folks, we're at the top of the hour. Sorry about your titan flooded canyons there, John. We'll have to talk about that next week. But uh, you've been listening to York Universe, folks, the astronomy and astrophysics program brought to you by the York University Astronomical Observatory. Very many thanks to the chat room crowd there at observatory.info.yorku.ca, keeping the observatory team uh, on their toes despite the cloudy skies. Please stay tuned because, of course, we've got lots more astronomy coming your way. Western world, science for the people, quirks and quarks. This is Astronomy Night in Canada, so please do stay tuned. But for the time being, from myself, Paul, I'm going to wish you all a great week, and uh, we'll be back same time next week. So Good night from me. And good night from me. We hope that you've enjoyed this program from AFM Radio, the broadcast.